I'm very glad to welcome our speaker and all of you to the first of these seminars in the Islamic section. I'm Brendan Wolf, the principal editor of the St. Andrew's Encyclopedia of Theology, which is so pleased to be able to sponsor this series of events, uh, which culminates, or at least begins to culminate, in the European Academy of Religion annual conference, which will be held here in June of 2023. Uh, the Encyclopedia is an open access resource for the theology of the major religions of the world, with all articles written from an internal perspective uh, to the faith they describe. Um, you can find more information about it, of course, on our website, saet.ac.uk. And uh, I hope we will have the benefit of many of you as readers in the future, as well as, of course, collaborators in other ways. Thank you. Professor Aude is president of the Makassid Institute Global, which is a think tank registered in a number of countries worldwide. Um, he's also Al Shatibi Chair of Makassid Studies at the International Peace College in South Africa and a founding and board member of the International Union for Muslim Scholars. He has held a number of visiting uh, positions I'm aware of, um, particularly in Southeast Asia. I seem to remember him there when I was working over in Southeast Asia, where McCarson is a big thing. Um, his latest book, entitled Re-Envisioning Islamic Scholarship, McCarson Meth Methodology as a New Approach, aims to restructure Islamic scholarship around a complex network of the higher objectives of Islamic law, both within the Quran and Sunnah. So, um, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Peace be with all of you. I am such, um, it, it's such an honor to be invited for the inaugural lecture of your section of the encyclopedia. Uh, thank you, Alex, and thank you, Brandon, for the invite. And um, uh, I am hoping that within the time allowed, I tease you with some of the ideas that come from the internal perspective that Brendan talked about, uh, rather than the usual perspective uh, that you might hear. Uh, the historical dimension is a very important dimension, even though I understand from Alex that this is not the objective of the encyclopedia. And I really appreciate that the encyclopedia would like to look at the current issues and the current stances. But we really cannot understand the current stances unless we go back a little bit in history and try to analyze history in a critical way and to see where these streams are coming from and trends in the Islamic theology and the Islamic law. I'm glad to hear as well that this section on Islamic theology also includes Islamic law because you really cannot separate both. And I, as I will try to explain uh, at the level that I cho chose to, to explain the topic at uh, today, that once the debate on the law becomes a very heated debate, scholars tend to go to the level of theology in order to make a point rather than stay at the level of the law. Uh, the elephant in the room, when you talk about Islamic theology and Islamic law, is politics. Because the issue of theology, including the schools that developed, that were named Kalami schools, the Mu'tazila and the Sha'ira and the Maturidi and the Salafi and the Shia and so forth, and the other schools of law that are named as in the Shafi'iyah and Ja'fariyah and Zaydiyah and uh, Ibadiyah and Ahnaf and so forth. There is a lot of politics in these divisions and in these debates. And it depends on what the scholars in one or the other of the streams are trying to legitimize, are trying to support, are trying to add to the authority of or increase in soft power uh, rather than hard power when it comes to the debates over theology and law. And this translates into the approach that a scholar takes to the Qur'an, because 
whether this is clear to many students of knowledge in Islamic studies or not, the Quran is at the core of Islam and the foundation. And the Quran is the message of Muhammad. And Muhammad, most of his life, actually just read the Quran rather than spoke all of these things that narrated, uh, that were narrated in uh, the Hadith Encyclopedia, and they were eventually um, very influential in forming what Islam is. But at the end, Muhammad is a bayan or an illustration of the Quran. The Quran says, and his wife Aisha said that he was a Quran walking on earth. Therefore, it depends on how you read the Quran, interpret, misinterpret the Quran in order to justify one or the other of the positions. If I may divide the positions into three groups of interest that uh, really guide the debates over theology and law, and I will talk about maqasid, maqasid al-shari'a, maqasid al-aqa'id, the, the objectives of the Islamic law, the objectives of the Islamic faith, as an example. The three groups would be the group of the de facto rulers. You're talking about the ruling systems since the middle of the first Islamic century when the uh, Islamic political system turned into a kingdom. And since that time, when we started to see this division of these three groups of scholars, and we started to see the group that we could call the scholars of the Sultan, the scholars of the government, the official scholars. That is the group that is trying to um, deal with issues of theology and law for the sake of the government's interests. And when you look at the government interests, it, you don't necessarily imagine a democracy, but rather an interest group, a tribe or a ruling family and so forth. The second group, uh, you could call the scholars of the school, not the scholars of the sultan. The scholars of the school, they are trying to legitimize their party, their group, their, their school. And the schools, yes, sometimes they collaborate with uh, the, the power, the de facto rulers, and sometimes they go against them. But the legitimization process that the scholars are going to deal with theology and law for is actually for the sake of the school. Whether the school, as I mentioned, is divided in a Kalami way, the Mu'tazila and the Sha'ira and so on, or the school is divided in a court jurisprudence way, Hanafis and Shafi'is and Ja'faris and so forth. And the third group, if I may say, is the people, the scholars of the people. And I wouldn't like to label them the scholars of God because now I'm using a tool that the two other scholars use when they claim to be speaking in the name of God. So the scholars of the Sultan, the scholars of the school, and the scholars of the Ummah, if you wish, or the scholars of the people are the three groups that really define the streams of Islamic theology and Islamic law rather than the superficial divisions based on the imams or based on the politics of the time that that took uh, place in the history uh, of Islam. Now, when the debate over issues of law becomes heated, we find that the scholars go up to the issues of theology, issues of faith. So in, in other words, it's not about right and wrong. It's about believer and disbeliever. Uh, it's about a faith, faithful person versus an infidel or, or a heretic. And I'll give you some examples. And now we can start to talk about schools of theology, uh, the schools of theology and schools of law and the role of maqasid al-sharia. One, the example of how the debate over al-adl, justice, translated eventually into a debate over Al-Qadr or destiny. The debate that started during the time of the Umayyads in the beginning was um, by people like Al-Hasan al-Basri and his students like Ghailan al-Dimashqi and others 
who eventually were labeled Mu'tazila, Mu'tazilites or the rational school. And their issue was not destiny or fate or how to understand that. Their issue was justice. And they labeled their group at Tawheed wal Adl, oneness of God and justice. That is the group that was called eventually Al Mu'tazila. And they have quite an elaborate explanation of the theory of justice in Islam based on the Quran. So the way they approached the Quran in the beginning, before they eventually became very politicized as a Mu'tazili group, they approached the Quran as the essence of it, the message, the higher purpose of it. Al Hassan al Basri was a student of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the fourth Khalifa, who was the first Imam of the Shia. And the Shia had another line, but Al Hassan al Basri developed his scholarship in a different way. And his issue was about justice, his debates with Al Hajjaj, the butcher of the Umayyads of Iraq, were actually over justice. How he is actually thinking that the Umayyads from the time of Muawiyah on had monopolized the public trust and took the fortunes of the Ummah into their bellies. And therefore, the way the movement started was about justice. Justice in the alternation of power. Uh, justice in the distribution of the public wealth, uh, and justice in issues of courts, etc. When Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, the, who, is, who is usually called the fifth guided caliph, uh, came in the Umayyad's time, he collaborated with the Mu'tazila of the time, with Ghailan, the Mashqi, and others. And Omar ibn Abdul Aziz was a coup against the political system that is going there uh, in, in the Umayyad's time. And he made them ministers around him, and he delegated them to take back what the Umayyads took in terms of land and gold and so on, and redistribute over the people. When Omar was killed by his cousins, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, by his cousins, because he decided that the caliph after him is not going to be from Bani Umayyah, is going to be from the Shia at that time. And he was killed. The Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, who came after him, decided that Ghailan and the others, the students of Al Hassan al Basri, are what is called Qadariya, are fatalists. And it was actually the other way around. It, the Qadariya was something that the Umayyad started from the middle of the first century with their kingdom, which interprets the Quran in a way that says that if you see injustice or poverty or tyranny, this is because of God's fate, is not because of something that you can change. And therefore, um, al Jabriya or that school that was eventually called the Jabriya or fatalism, was actually the real Qadariya, the real fatalist school. But they called the Hassan al-Basri school at that time the fatalists or the Qadaris. And the ulama sultan or the scholars of the sultan came and interrogated some of them, read about the interrogation of Ghailan, for example, and they decided that they are apostates because they believe in free will and they believe in justice. Free will as in the humans create their actions. They never denied that God created everything anyway, but they took the Quran for interpretation to say that humans create as well. And the Quran has some of this versus that everything is pre-created and we are just unfolding a pre-set scenario. And the preset scenario, fatalism kind of philosophy, the Umayyads had made very public because they wanted to support their kingdom. So the scholars of the Sultan worked for the power of the Umayyads. The scholars of the sect at that time or of the school were not formed this way. They were still in the bracket of the scholars of the Ummah, of the people. When 
the revolution against the Umayyads eventually worked and the Abbasides came. The Abbasides, as usual, in the history of revolutions in the Muslim land, there is a public revolution and then people have a coup on the revolutionists. So the revolution against the Umayyads were actually supported primarily by the people who were called Mu'tazila and the people who were called Shia afterwards. But then the Abbasides, when they came, they decided to have a coup d'etat against these people and they persecuted them. Uh, Al-Mu'tazila eventually found an alliance with uh, Al-Ma'mun of the time and then Al-Mutawakkil uh, made the coup against Al-Ma'mun's ways and persecuted Al-Mu'tazila. My point is that how the higher purpose of justice and reading the book in terms of justice as the higher purpose, as the criteria by which you read the book has transformed into whether you read the book in a fatalistic way and everything is predestined in that sense or uh, or not and therefore people were persecuted. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik after Umar ibn Abdul Aziz decided to crucify Qaylan and the students of Al Hassan al-Basri anyway and they went through a very uh, tough period until the end of the Umayyads time. Um, I give you another example on how the uh, issue of al-aql or the the higher purpose of rationality, if you wish, I don't like the word rationality, but rather re reason, if you wish, has translated into a shara. So now the schools of the eventually Mu'tazila and Shia and so on believed in what is called al-aql in the reason. And reason led them to the proposal that God has purposes behind his actions and his legislation. And because of that, they actually had this as a foundation in order to do what is called in the Islamic jurisprudence ishtihad, or new thinking or new reasoning about things, because they believed that God had purposes. They tried to discover these purposes from the Qur'an. So I'm talking pre the third century when the term Maqasid Sharia started to appear. This is just the idea of Maqasid. So the idea of God having purposes was eventually rejected because no, God doesn't have purposes. Is he lower than purposes? No. The scholars of the Sultan said God is higher than purposes. If you have a purpose, then you need the purpose and God doesn't need anything. So therefore, they said that there is no idea of purposes or maqsid or even illa in what God uh, does or says in terms of legislation or the natural world. But there is a shark. There is the, the, the canon. Uh, and I, I'm translating shara as canon. Usually a shara is translated as the way. Shara, sharia in Arabic is a way. Sharia is a way of life. It's not really a canon or a law or any of that. But they translated a shara as a canon, really. And they made the particular school that is official in the government as the school that defines that canon. And that canon doesn't go by the higher purposes. It goes by the imams of the school. It goes by the how the theorists of the school define the shara, define the law. And they define the law in a particular way regardless of the higher purpose. The higher purposes would do a lot of renewal in the thought of the school. But the schools at that time wanting a piece of the pie, especially during the Abbasid time, they decided that no, they are not going to renew. They closed the door of what's called the jihad or the new reasoning because they wanted to keep any ruling for themselves in the political sense, in the power sense. And therefore, the scholars of the Ummah who are trying to renew and trying to critique and they do not want their own talk to become law or any of that, they were persecuted. Even though they were used afterwards as icons for these schools. Like, for example, Abu Hanifa did not think that Al-Mansur, who was the Khalifa of the time, the Abbasid, was legitimate. 
and did not accept Al Mansur's, you know, gifts and maids and these things. And Al Mansur wanted him to become a judge, and Abu Hanifa decided that he's not going to be a judge in an illegitimate government. So Abu Hanifa was thrown in prison, and I believe in the narration that he was poisoned in prison by Al Mansur, even though Al Mansur prayed the funeral prayer over him afterwards, anyway. But Abu Hanifa died as an opposition leader, as a scholar of the Ummah. And people were not happy in Iraq when he died this way in prison because he was against the status quo that is happening. Uh, Ash-Shafi had a similar experience and he was imprisoned during the time of Harun Rashid Basaid. And he also refused to become a judge, even though afterwards he befriended Harun, gave him some poetry and so on, and Harun allowed him to go and live in Egypt, not become a judge, but to live in Egypt. So he refused eventually to become a scholar of the sultans. But a shafi became a school as well. But look at what happened, for example, between a shafis and the Hanafis. So supposedly the students of Abu Hanifa and the students of a shafi in Damascus, eventually, during the time of Al-Ghazali, or Al-Ghazali, during the time of Al-Ghazali, they um, were not the status quo law. The courts were Hanafi. And the powerful party, political party, you can look at the Madhahib or the schools as political parties, really. The powerful party was the Hanafis at that time. And the prince of the time of Damascus really liked Al-Ghazali. So he wanted to change the law from the Hanafi law to the Shafi'i law, the Shara'a. It's no longer about al aql it's no longer about Ishtihad, it's about the Sharia as in fiqh, as in defined by one school. And when he changed the court from the Hanafis to the Shafi'is, the Hanafis and, and did not like that. In order to make Ghazali, obviously, the judge of the judges, the Hanafis burned and looted Damascus in their fight with the Shafi'is. And eventually you find, when you visit the old mosques in Cairo or Baghdad, you find four different pulpits or four different mihrabs because that because they didn't pray behind each other. They didn't consider each other to be, to be even authentic Muslims or praying right. Or, and they elevated the debate over law to a debate over theology, over that these people are not even believers. They, they pray and they wash like that and we don't wash like that, this kind of thing. Now, I want to move forward to what is happening today in terms of Maqasid al-Sharia. Maqasid al-Sharia is a tool for renewal, but it was not meant to be so in its history. In its history, from the 3rd century on, Maqasid was just maxims. You know, when you read in the Islamic law about the maxims, uh, whether you are talking about al amri the philosopher, who, the philosopher who developed al maqasid as the philosophy of the criminal punishments. So because of the criminal punishment of adultery, hifd al-ard or al-ard or the dignity or the uh, offspring, the protection of the offspring and the protection of faith and the protection of mind, uh, progeny and so forth and the protection um, uh, of money or wealth and these protections started in the fourth century eventually al juwaini developed them and al ghazali uh, and the shatibi shatibi though was different because until al ghazali maqasid was just a way of philosophizing about the law was not a basis of making law or making ijtihad or thinking about new situations was not as as we do today when we say maqasid and we try to give an opinion on issues related to women's rights, let's say. It was not like that in the past. It was just a maxim, a way of thinking in an usuli thing. And the usul al-fiqh was totally separate from fiqh. You know, even until al-Shatibi, al-Shatibi's book on maqasid has nothing to do with al-Shatibi as a faqih. Al-Ghazali's book on maqasid or his part of maqasid in his mustasfa, his book on the fundamentals of law, has nothing to do with al-Ghazali the faqih, the shafi'i that people fight over the Shafi'i Madhab in his time. Uh, he, he was much more developed when it comes to the usul or the fundamental theories, and he could talk about maqasid and building the world on them, 
But as a faqih, he's just copying from the past, from the books that became canonized in the schools that became official. Al-Maqasid, though, developed by a shatibi to become more of a Mu'tazili kind of theology. And Sheikh Ahmed al-Tayyib, the current Sheikh of Sheikh al-Azhar, has a very interesting paper for those who are interested on the aqidah or the creed of Shatabi, saying that Shatabi more or less is actually Mu'tazili, is not really Maliki, because he is putting the Maqasid as the basis of the law and the basis of the creed, not just as something that comes after the law, that you think about the preservation of mind and progeny and so on. It's actually that preservation of mind and progeny. And if you want to add justice and so forth, and shot, he talked about justice in page one of his volume, th volume three of the book, where he talked about maqasid. Justice in that sense is not the basis, is no longer the outcome of the law, but the basis of the law. So back to the Mu'tazili ideas. Um, Shatabi was picked up by Muhammad Abdu, really, to come to the contemporary times in the time that is left for me. And Muhammad Abdu brought Shatibi back to the Islamic discourse after he almost disappeared from the Islamic discourse by bringing him back to Al-Azhar of the time. And therefore, you're talking about Rashid Rida and Abdullah Draz, the father of Muhammad, and then Muhammad Abdullah Draz, and then eventually the school, the Azhari school, that continued with Shaltut and Abu Zahra and so on, all the way to Qaradawi, uh, Allah bless his soul. And all of these people, this is the, the school that brought the Shatibi back and made the arguments of the Shatibi, again, basis of the law. And these people, yes, they had to compromise with the political powers of the time, each in their own time, own time but they were back to the serving of the Ummah, of the people, and they were back to supporting revolutionary idea to change political status quo. And they were back to the way the Hassan al-Basri students started the movement of the people, uh, building obviously on the heritage of Al-Husayn ibn Ali and others, but without necessarily being in the school of the Shia that became a school that has its own political interests eventually and has its own theology based on a sequence of imams and so on that the early imams never talked about anyway. And the protection of the imams from sin and all of that stuff that came eventually. And in our time, the Safawi, the Shayyur, you know, the Safawis actually uh, changed uh, Shia as much as the Salafis changed the, what's called the Sunnah Islam. So today, when we talk about Maqasid Sharia, we're either apologizing for a status quo political or economical or social, or we are using this as a vehicle for new thought. If you are talking about the vehicle for a new thought, you're not really talking about maqasid sharia anymore, the necessities, the needs, and the luxuries, and the shatibi classification. You're actually talking about maqasid al-Qur'an, the maqasid, the objectives of the Qur'an. This is the new movement that is trying to take the idea of purposes the teleological dimension, if you wish, of Islam in order to renew the Islamic thought. That is what the scholars of the Ummah, the scholars of the people are trying to do today versus the scholars of the interests, the scholars of the Sultan. But the Sultan is no longer a Khalifa. Uh, the Sultan is the bank, had the government and the international companies. Uh, look how IP is justified by Maqasid al-Sharia. Uh, in so many theses, uh, intellectual property. And instead of critiquing what intellectual property is doing in the world, people are saying that this is actually Hifz al This is the preservation of mind and preservation of wealth. And therefore, they justify the intellectual property apparatus. Uh, for one example, since we just came out, hopefully, of a pandemic, and we saw how IP could damage the world, and basically how... Maqasid al-Sharia is justifying that. Look at how Maqasid al-Sharia is justifying what we call an Islam usury, uh, you know, and, but instead of the um, good old bank, uh, it's an Islamic bank now. It, you know, it wears a hijab and abaya and, uh, and it calls itself murabaha. But it, it is the good old, the same thing. If anybody who studied riba 
in Islam knows that the system is riba anyway, and this is part of the capitalist system, but it's just a marketing tool. When, you know, I heard from one of those scholars who work in that area, it's a marketing tool at the end, but it is a capitalist enterprise. So Maqasid al-Sharia is now used for the sake of the Sultan, but the new ways of the Sultan. Most of the executives are people who come and go, good or corrupt. They have the cycle, especially in today's democracies and in dictatorships, they wait for the next coup to come and go. But they are not the real hardcore powers in the society. The hardcore powers in the society, the economic and the political system of the international companies and the international uh, legal system is actually now supported by scholars of the Sultan this way, using maqasid al-Sharia, using these fluffy terms of the preservation of mind and wealth and intellect to justify every sin in the book. And people who are back to the book, they say that the sins in the book cannot be justified and the higher purpose is still the oneness of God and justice for the people. As the good old Mu'tazila said, and I'm not Mu'tazili, by the way, but just repeating what I find very smart in our history in that sense. And they are trying to bring a new blood. The new blood is being persecuted today, finally, because it doesn't ride on any of the soft powers that is, that, that is sought uh, from seeking Islamic scholarship. Um, there are so many people who don't identify with these schools, so many scholars who don't identif identify with the Sunni or Shia divide or the Hanafi and Shafi'i and so forth or the Zaydi and Shia. But these people are not given a platform because these people are not the scholars of the Sultan in any way of how the power is defined today. But there are undercurrents of renewal and you can look at the Arab Spring as one of those undercurrents, I believe. When people are trying to go back to the essence of justice as the essence of the Sharia, really, and forget about this clergy that defined uh, what Islam is from the middle of the first century, Islamic, which is the end of the seventh century, until today, that that is no longer a popular argument. And the more complex the problems become and the more the traditional scholars are showing that they're not capable of dealing with them and they are just, you know, serving the powers there is, and especially how the international political and economic system is working today, the more the average Muslim is hopefully trying to look back at, oh, the, the idea of the oneness of God and justice as basis of Islam is actually a good idea. And this is not fatalism. It's the other way that is fatalism. I will stop here. I hope that uh, these thoughts uh, are you know, provoking some of uh, your, your ideas. And I do apologize if I use terms or references that are not familiar to some of you, but I thought that uh, I should keep uh, the, the uh, level of the discourse at that level so that we can have a discussion. And thank you very much again for inviting me. Congratulations for this new project. And we're looking forward to reading. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was very good. Very enjoyable. Very uh, very knowledgeable, of course. Um, I have I have questions I can ask, but I won't abuse my position as chair. Rather, I'll uh, open it up to the floor. So if anybody has a question, please put up your hand virtually. So, uh, Brenton, shall we start with you? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting paper, which, of course, in drawing on history to make conceptual observations, is uh, doing uh, many of the things we want our encyclopedia to comment. Um, I have a, uh, a question about um, something that wasn't mentioned, and I'm interested to know whether it wasn't mentioned just because it isn't the focus of your of your talk, or whether this is simply not a move that the tradition makes. Uh, if you know, if one of the the goals 
of the law is is the um, establishment or emphasis of the oneness of God. Are there attempts to think about the higher reasons for what you might call ceremonial law or ritual purity or for injunctions to worship and so forth, which can point towards other actions that humans should take as part of worshiping God or as part of giving him the glory he deserves in this world. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much. The, the oneness of God, no, it's a pretty much a part and parcel of what I'm trying to say. The oneness of God is not just a rational exercise in Islam. The oneness of God is about an emotional relationship with God. And what is called maqasid al-aqaid or the objectives of the creed that are part of the interpretation of the Quran is why does God teach us about his mercy so that we would be merciful and we would love him and so forth. Why would he teach us about his power so that we can rely on him? Uh, why and so forth. So the whys of God are actually all related to what you could call tasawuf or Sufism. Or let's say this school is the school that really took care of these kinds of topics. But this to these topics are everywhere. Every scholar of Islam talked about these kinds of things. But it was a tasawuf or the Sufism that took care of the objectives of the attributes of God. And the oneness of God in terms of the old Mu'tazili uh, thought was tied to justice because they, they had their argument building from the oneness of God to justice being a law for the universe, uh, not just a law for the people, and not just in the legal sense, but any balance of the universe was part of that oneness of God, that it's God and everything else, and everything else is balanced based on the oneness of God. And this is tied as well to the theory on beautification, if you wish, and anglification, tahsin wa taqbih. And that beautification and uglification, anything that has to do with God was beautiful. And anything that has to do with anything against him would, was ugly. And that's their entry point to the law. They did not enter the law through the courts, but rather entered the issue of the law through the beauty and ugly, uh, an ugliness kind of concept. Thank you. Oliver, I think you're next. I'd like to ask. Thank you, and thank you very much for this really interesting talk. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my my question comes entirely uh, colored by my background, which is in Christian theology. So again, I, I apologize that this is an obvious or an easy question. Um, I'm curious about the relationship between um, the concept of heresy, because you touched on this a little bit about sort of this distinction between um, you know the dispute between a, a faithful person or a non-believer and or a heretic. Um, and, and and the idea of of, of novelty, because um, you've talked a lot about this idea, of course, of you know the vehicles for new thoughts and all of that. Um, and in in historical Christian theology, of course, one of the great barometers for heresy was novelty, and the idea of something being a new theological formulation. Um, and of course, the turning point is who who decides what is novel and and, and what has always existed in the tradition. Um, so I'm interested in. Fred, and again, from your own perspective, and this is a, with apologies to Alex, this is perhaps a very historical question, um, what the relationship is in your understanding between um, accusations of heresy in, in, the, in these sort of discussions, especially around justice, and, and novelty, and sort of this, this pressing need to be dealing with new situations um, when we confront questions of justice. Well, thank you for the question. It's, it's very similar dynamics uh, that you could see on the Islamic front between heresy and novelty, uh, what they call ridda, which is the heresy, and what they call bid'ah, which is the novelty in Arabic. And heresy or non-heresy is tied to the articles of faith. And the Quran talked about the articles of faith, not just for Muslims, but for the people of the book, for everybody, to believe in God and his angels and his messages and the messengers, like messages as in books, and messengers and the year after. And God said in the Quran that if, if you believe in those, then you are a believer. And he even said that there are people of the book who believe in God and the hereafter and the angels and the book. And therefore, they will be saved in the hereafter. The Quran said that in a number of places. So Muslims 
in their heresy debates, they made heresy out of no heresy issues. So you disagree with them on some legal issue and they call you heretic because, I mean, I wrote a book about the return of women to the mosque because so many, about half of the Islamic schools don't even allow women from the door of the mosque. I, return, I, I wrote a book, I received so many like heresy uh, insults and all I'm quoting is the Quran, the Prophet's tradition, but they elevated the debate from being about the law to being about faith. And, and I'm supposed to be heretic because I disagreed with a couple of hadith in Bukhari or Muslim, the, the hadith collections. And therefore, they, they, they did that. Who is to decide? In the Quran, it's easier than what I understand is in the Christian or Jewish history. Um, you could believe in one of the rabbis and the other rabbi says something opposite. I don't think that the Quran is as open to interpretations as the Torah is uh, or the gospel. Uh, I think the Quran is clear. Uh, and of course, it was part of the politics of tyranny to say that the Quran is not clear and therefore you need a scholar to clarify it for you. But if you read it, it's, it's clear. It's just, it says that these are the articles of faith and these are people, I don't know, you're allowed to marry and these are and this is usury and this is trade and, and, and that's it. But when you go to the details that are not mentioned in the Quran and therefore not important in Islam are not part of the Islamic faith, you'll find that people are either attributing to Muhammad, peace be upon him, sayings that he did not say in order to add stuff to Islam, or they are attributing to their school a fundamental or a matter of consensus or any of these things in order to call the other person heretic. And, and if you deny the consensus, you are a, an infidel, they say in, in some of the books of those who. So it's similar, yeah, you know, it, it's similar dynamics, uh, God help us. Thank you, that's very interesting. Yeah, hey, uh, Bill Shackman, I think you're, you're, you're next if you want to ask. I thank you for that really interesting talk. Um, so I, I'm, I'm the academic editor for the Judaism section and, um, I, I, I was just fascinated at the, the many parallels to the Jewish legal tradition. And, um, but the, 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 one of the striking differences seems to me the, um, the, in, in, in Jewish legal thought, there's very much an emphasis on on um, on trying to distance oneself from a rationale for the commandments, right? So the commit the so that they, we can kind of approach, you know, jurisprudence issues from an almost objective stance. And I think part of that is that historically, when whenever you know when philosophers started trying to find philosophical reasons for the commandments. Um, controversy followed. Uh, there were, you know, people would stop praying in a traditional manner because they could meditate uh, in a philosophical manner. Um, or when Kabbalists came up with mystical reasons for the commandments, you know, uh, you know, uh, heretical followers could could say, "Oh well, we can affect those, you know, those those um, those same results without resorting to, you know, following the rituals." Uh, in the commandments, and then you know it, it would lead to an abrogation of of, of the law, and so historically, um, you know, as well as I think philosophically, there's there's a kind of a a tension there, and I wondered whether there there's a similar tension in the Islamic tradition, whether there's a school of thought that that simply denies the possibility of a higher reason for the law. And, and and you know and and tries to distance itself from any kind of rationale for for following the law. Yeah, actually, w what you are saying is something I hear uh, from uh, people who has questions and comments in almost every lecture. Uh, where are you taking us? You're taking us to the world of rationale, and therefore people are not going to pray and they will meditate and people are not going to fast and say that they can, you know, drink or whatever and uh, and so forth because 
the once you talk about the rational, people think that the whole religion is going to be uh, disintegrated by 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 these ideas. Um, what my answer is usually is is that th there is a difference between what the Quran stresses as obligations and what the Quran does not stress or does not obligate from us. So the Quran did obligate for Muslims to pray in the morning and the midday and the evening. So at least those three times. And those three times are the times that the Prophet prayed five times with, but twice in the second and third time. And the Quran is talking about fasting in Ramadan. So this is not going to go anywhere and nobody is going to get out of the fasting of the eighth month of the lunar year because of that. And the Quran is saying in two pages, uh, whom you're allowed to marry, one, two, three, four, whom you're not allowed to marry, one, two, three, four. It's, it's not going to change. We're not going to change the definition of marriage because the Quran is detailing that and the Quran and so forth. So my answer is that the difference, I think, is in terms of how detailed the essential part of the law is in the Quran versus in the current Torah. Uh, and once you go beyond the written Torah to the oral Torah, it's an open field. Now, so everybody's saying any, you know, any direction, you will find so many directions. Uh, I'm familiar with Ibn Maymun or my Maimonides, my and I can see that he's taking the Torah in a very different planet from where the Torah is. Um, so that is the difference. But what you're saying is exactly a tool that some people use from the tyrannical side and and that's why the Salafis, where the countries of today in the Arab world are Salafis, that's that's why they are Salafis, because they don't want people to think about Islam in terms of its rationale. And the matters of justice are so central in the book, in the Quran. You know, God, God said several times that he sent messengers and books for the sake of justice. Uh, and that justice is the message and so forth. So they don't want to go there especially issues of justice. And because of the monopolies they have over natural resources that uh, we in the West here need, that is the dynamic. That's why you end up with theology that is non-rational. But rationality is, is pretty much, you know, what the Quran is calling for. That's my understanding. And then Alice, I think you're next. Uh, hi, so uh, hi. my computer keeps freezing. I don't know if you can see me all right and hear me okay. I can see you and hear you okay. Okay, good. Hi. Um, so thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, so I'm a scholar of um, ancient Indian religion and I don't know very much about Islam. So some of my questions might be a little bit basic and excuse me if they are. And probably I'm going to ask you about something you asked about a lot. So uh, the house of wisdom, the idea of the house of wisdom, I know it, it was until maybe quite recently thought of to be a library, but now is it more like a school? And some of these schools that you were talking about, do they come out of this? And then I read a little bit about some Islamic philosophers like Al-Farabi, I think it was, and how these philosophers influenced the West and Western thought. In terms of philosophy and with Al Farabi, it was something like I think there was something to do with ethics and society as well. So I was wondering how much these ideas of law were influential outside of Islam. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, th thank you. This is a question that will fill quite a gap in the talk I gave. Uh, thank you, Alice. Uh, actually, the House of Wisdom was an endowment. Uh, was a waqf, what they call waqf in Islam, because research, research centers, it was a research center, uh, basically built by al Ma'mun to study fiqh or the understanding, but not in the legal sense. So law, but not in the canon sense. And therefore you find, for example, Al-Jahil, he wrote in the House of Wisdom, his book on zoology, on zoology, that is called Al-Hayawan or the animal. Uh, he wrote that book on zoology in the House of Wisdom uh, because that was his job. It, it's a research center. And that book on zoology, if you read the introduction of Al-Jahil, uh, 
he mentioned that this is a book on fiqh. So they did not define fiqh in the House of Wisdom as narrow as it is after the time of al Ma'mun. Uh, after the time of Ma'mun, until today, especially post colonization and colonization as well, fiqh became jurisprudence or law. Uh, and fiqh in the Quran is a deep understanding, it's not necessarily the legal side of Islam, even though it's part of it, but it's also the zoology uh, research, the astronomy research. Uh, read about Ibn al Haytham eventually, uh, Ibn al Haytham and how impacted Newton how he impacted Isaac Newton in his theory on gravity uh, and his optics and so, so much that Ibn al-Haytham had actually contributed. Uh, read about how they, from the time of uh, al-Jafar uh, Sadiq, the student of Abu Hanifa, who was the imam of the Jafaris, of the Twelvers, the Shia, how from his time they calculated the circumference of the earth in a very accurate way and they drew the galaxies in. So the houses of wisdom were actually how the Muslim society had research. Research was not sponsored by businesses or governments, it was sponsored by charity. And that idea was also the idea of the libraries, which were called houses of books. The house of, of, re of wisdom is research center. The house of books is the libraries. So the libraries that were built eventually in North Africa, Southern Europe, all the way to India today and China, these were also endowments. People in their wills usually give one quarter, one third of their wealth as an endowment fund. And these endowments would build that. So the libraries were not tied to the IP business, but rather was an independent uh, charity funded kind of initiative, social initiative. Um, look at the history of hospitals as well. There is a lot of medicine sciences that were built uh, in the House of Wisdom of Baghdad and eventually the other Houses of Wisdom. And read about the history of Carthage, for example, in terms of the history of the hospitals there. How hospitals were endowments too. And the research and the medication was part of the charity work that the society does. And therefore, medicine was not a business in life and death, basically, throughout that golden period. Uh, eventually, with colonization, all of this changed into the system we're familiar with today here in, in the West, which is a secular system where the basic needs of the society is governed by interest groups or businesses or governed by governments uh, during the times when the governments in the Islamic majorities leaned to the left uh, but pre the colonization time, it was actually charity that guaranteed the basic needs of the society in terms of hospitals and research centers and what's called madrasas are eventually the universities, Al-Azhar, etc., uh, where, you know, I grew up learning the Quran in my childhood, was actually a, a, a an endowment until all the time of Nasser. Uh, Nasser made it a ministry and made Sheikh Al-Azhar a minister and all of that because he did not want a free civil society, but uh, the, the sheikhs of Al-Azhar pre-Nasr were the leaders of the society because they were paid by the endowments, not paid by the government as ministers and directors and stuff. So this idea is actually worth uh, looking at. Look at uh, the book that's called 1001 Inventions of the Muslim Civilization, and the references therein are actually very nice. They will take you to so, so much of, uh, of of that knowledge. Thanks, sir. Uh, I think, yes, we have one more question. Reza, would you like to... Uh... Yes, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. I really, really enjoyed it. I thought you did a marvelous job of bringing together so much of uh, embryonic Islamic history and showing us how that is the uh, a, a very good angle of entry into this area. One of the things that you said about the intellect that made me think about the centrality of, of justice and the discernment of justice therein is that uh, the intellect combined with uh, the Shi'i conception of ethics, of husn wa qubh, akli, 
How important do you think that was as a determinant of the specific focus on the, uh, and I'll let you translate that for, for, for everybody, um, the husam, uh, the, the beauty of uh, good actions as opposed to the intrinsic ugliness of actions that can be discerned by the intellect. How much did that approach to ethics have an impact upon the whole approach to the discernment of justice and the the struggle for justice? Well, thank you very much. Uh, the the husn and qubh uh, aqli could be translated as the beautification and uglification based on reason. And actually, it's not only a Shia uh, belief. It was also a Mu'tazili belief. And it was also pretty much in the scholars of the Ummah from the Sunni side. Like, like Muhammad Abdu, for example, talks about beautification and uglification in the exact same way as it is in the Shia tradition and in the Mu'tazili tradition, even though he was a Mufti of Egypt uh, at the time and the Shafi'i or Hanafi Madhab or any of that. And I believe that this is one of the important tools of bringing the real Islam back to the debate uh, because it is not it's not purely based on reason the tahseen and taqbih the beautification and uglification it's actually based on a mind that is impacted by the Quran uh, if you look at the Mu'tazilis they were not rationalists I mean they were not Kantian or any of that they were Quranists. They come from a Quranic perspective. And they beautify and uglify based on an understanding of the Quran. Um, and I think that the streams of the Shia that still believes in that are the hope in the Shia community to change the kind of Akhbari, kind of Safawi, kind of the, the rigid mentality into a more open mentality because once you look at the politics of today, they are no longer going by ugliness and beauty. They they are against beauty. They are against you know they they. It's not a matter of justice anymore, and it's not a matter of the interest of the people. It's just power, as much as power in the other countries around them that uh, compete over power in that region. Um, I think that the importance is the tying to what is called al-hurriya, or freedom of choice. Uh, the the, the Mu'tazili were very good at this. They tied justice to freedom. And they believed in this creation of our actions, khalqul af'al, the creation of our actions by ourselves, because they wanted to promote human freedom. They did not think that everything is predestined, even though they did not deny that God created everything. But they wanted us to have a, the freedom to choose. And the streams from the Sunni and Shia and Khawarij and you name it, schools that came that believed in this idea were different from the others. So I'm actually, I'm kind of disputing this classification along the lines of Sunni and Shia and within Sunni, the Ja'fari and the, the Hanafi and, and so forth. I, I am against this kind of classification. And I find it a very political classification because at the end, the scholars who are true to the message of the Quran and to the service of the people are the same. I, there is no difference for me in the thought of uh, Imam al-Sadr, for example, al-Sadr of Iraq that, that Saddam killed. And, you know, other scholars from the Sunni, like Abdullah Dras, for example. Muhammad Abdullah Draz. I don't see a difference from the same generation between Draz and the Sadr. They are the same scholars. They say the same thing. Their approach to ethics is the same. But the Sadr was labeled Shia and this and because and Draz was under the Egyptians. So I, I, I think that um, we need to go beyond that classification into at least looking at who are the scholars that are genuine to the higher objectives of the message of Islam versus the scholars who are just trying to use these silos of categories of groups and sects in order to promote certain interest groups. Thank you very much.